Look, I'm just a geologist. I like rocks. I love rocks. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Geology Flannel Cast. My name is Steve. Hey, I'm Chris. And I'm Jesse. And we're and, here. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. We, we literally talked about this two minutes ago. We're like, we're gonna it was have like a, 30 seconds ago. We're going to have a tight <laughs> intro tonight. Well, all we said was the intro. We didn't say where the intro was going to go after that. No, that's a good point. Said, yeah, we uh, just came uh, up with an order. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> One of these days, we'll figure out how to start off a podcast sounding professional. And but until that day comes, you're just gonna have to deal with us. We're doing yeah. the best we can, all right? Uh, yeah. Just well, that that'll be September because it's still tell a friend August. So uh -huh. don't forget tell a friend August. <laughs> we got one more week. Next week is still the 31st. We still got. Oh, well, I guess by the time the podcast next week comes out, it'll be September. So. Ah, yeah, which means we have to pick a winner from our Facebook. Yeah, we we got a bunch contest. of contests. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, everyone. Man, we got a honestly we got a, we got a crap ton of. This is going to be difficult. Like, I I thought like maybe yeah. we get like five, but we're gonna actually have to go through all these pictures and. Um, and it's funny. I was thinking like, wow, this is getting tough. Like maybe we'll have to have like our wives or girlfriends help with this, but Jesse's wife entered the contest. <laughs> So yeah, I, he's using my rocks. <laughs> <laughs> like... So uh, yeah, without saying, you know, she can't win. It's, uh, <laughs> it's like one of those, you know, you cannot be an employee, even though we That's, don't really have employees. Does she but... have enough flannel cast stickers to begin with, though? Like, <laughs> <laughs> she would probably say too many. <laughs> <laughs> nice, uh, but yes, keep it up. Thank you for all the posts and the pictures. And yes, very, very cool. It is going to be difficult to pick a winner. We'll figure it out, though. We'll, we'll do something. Yeah. I don't know. But uh, I did no, have uh, someone ask us, can we please bring the T-shirts back? I didn't have the heart to tell her. We never really actually had T-shirts. <laughs> but maybe, maybe next year's our year. Don't, don't even start. Don't there. even start. No. You know what that means? You won't hear us till 2022 now. Well, yeah. <laughs> it all depends on like when you're listening to this. Next yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah, every, that's true. Every time you say the t-shirts are coming around, we just do a four-year hiatus and it all <laughs> it all goes to crap and we all just <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. But maybe yeah. if we had some uh, additional sponsors. Well, let's start off with the. Well, we have one. Why don't we start? We off have one tools? wonderful sponsor, and it, and it's actually a great product that I love endorsing. It's the formatting formula, formattingformula.com or YouTube forward slash C forward slash formatting formula. They take care of all of your word documenting formatting needs. Essentially, um, I had no idea what Word was even capable of until I met the formatting formula, and they blew my mind. And to this day, I still, I barely scratch the surface with anything that comes to Word compared to what these folks at the Formatting Formula do. Um, so check them out on YouTube. Uh, they have videos even on older versions of Word too. So if you have an old document, I, I don't know, have you ever done this before? We had a, a document saved from like years ago. And then it says like, do you want to upgrade? And you upgrade it and everything gets all jumbled and jambled. Jambled, that's a scientific term. It's very good. Uh, <laughs> uh, the formatting formula can actually undo that, figure it out, put it back the way it's supposed to look, and you know, move you on your way, and you can be a happy camper. So, check them out. They have videos. They have services where they can do it for you. They have videos so you can learn how to, you know, do it yourself. Um, so please check them out. We can't thank you enough, formatting formula, for sponsoring us. And don't forget to tell them the geology flannel cast saying that way. Uh, you know, they'll continue to be our sponsor. So yeah, we can, we could carry over. It's, it's tell a friend August. It is. So, so when you're, when you're telling a friend about the podcast, which you should also tell them about the formatting formula. Yeah, exactly. And then you can tell them right after that, tell them about how you're a Patreon and how wow. they should be a Patreon too. Yeah. Anything that, you know, help keep the lights on. <laughs> I just I just bought a new laptop and this puts us in the red until like 2024. <laughs> <Yeah>. So 
<laughs> for, so for a little insider tip about this podcast, uh, Steve had this, this uh, little laptop they kept on, well, restarting in the middle of the podcast. And I think Jesse and I held it together very well because Steve yeah. was just like, you know, disappear. His, for it, it disappear three and I could, I could see on, you know, we record this on zoom and I could see the look of terror on Jesse's face. Like, I don't <laughs> know where to go from here. And we would go into like uh, damage control mode, but um, I, I like how Chris basically just said, I'm useless and I don't even need to be here. <laughs> I mean, it, just in more words than that. That's <laughs> You're well, not useless. Who would do her intro if it wasn't for you? <laughs> <laughs> and who would talk together. over me during my intro if it you, wasn't for you, Chris? You hold it together. <laughs> I mean, the, between the three of us, I mean, it's pretty much the ultimate in scientific podcasting. I cannot see it getting any better than this. Yeah, I mean, we have over 200,000 downloads. Right now, we're number 66 yeah. in the nation for science podcasts. Earth science? Science. Natural science. Natural science. On the iTunes charts. Yeah, yeah. We're, um, thank you, everyone, so much for, for downloading the, uh, the episodes. And uh, yeah, thank you. We're, yeah. Doing, uh, we're getting there. We're getting yeah, there. Yeah, keep up the good work. Uh, if you do, you know, always give us a rate or review, as they all say. But it does yeah. help. It helps uh, bump us up so other people it pops up on their suggestions and they can be, they can experience the premier geology uh, podcast. That's true. The premier geology podcast. It's uh, the best award we ever gave ourselves. <laughs> it's the only award we've ever given ourselves. <laughs> we need up to that. All right, let's, uh, let, let's, let's, let's kick this off. Uh, so we just got an episode today. We're just going to kind of talk about some, uh, news stories, some current events stories, and just kind of, yeah, you know, give, give, give a. We're gonna tell you guys our take on these, uh, on these news stories. So um, it's like a full episode of Jesse's Corner, really, and or Steve Stoop, Steve Stoop, or Chris's conundrum. I, I forget know. what it was. I forget what Chris's corner. Is that what we said? I thought it was Chris's corner. Jesse, well, in your reality, yeah, it should yeah, be it's Jesse's better. corner. It's, 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 I don't want to turn it into like Highlander here. <laughs> Thunderdome. <laughs> no, I'm happy with this being Jesse's thing. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, it also it, helps when my computer craps out and he can just keep on talking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness Jesse has the gift of gab. He can just, you know. Go off. On <laughs> that's that's my, I actually said in my um, in my intro video for my online class, I was like, "Look, ninety percent of my teaching is rambling stories, and I can't do that on video. So, you, I feel like you're missing something. So sorry. Uh, I feel like it was just me being like, uh, this students is be being boring. like, what did I pay for? Yeah." <laughs> It's depressing. <laughs> they they literally told us in our one training to cut out fun facts. That is ninety eight percent of my teaching. I remember. I was like, who, yeah. who wants to cut out fun facts? That's <laughs> I, like I. A lot of students I get feedback from say like, you know, or or they'll they'll be close to getting the answer and they'll write down like, I remember when you said this fun fact about yeah. the, I, how it kind of relates. I barely, and I was like, most teachers can barely keep students awake with the fun facts. You take the fun <laughs> facts away. It's just, I, you're going to, you're going to have just narcolepsy across the board. I just, I, I don't know about you, Chris, all my students are sitting on the edge of their seat waiting for my every word to come out of my mouth. I, I'm talking about. They want us to make these videos in like 15 minute segments. I can't get through an introduction in 15 minutes. Oh man. My, my videos are like, <laughs> like I, at one point I was just doing one section of one PowerPoint. And it was at like 28 minutes. I was like, okay, I'm just going to end here now. And then I just hit stop, take a breath, get a sip of water, hit start, just record the next one. Like, welcome back. It, yeah, it might as well just be an hour and a half long. But. See, I mine, I'm like, welcome to my basement. I got my pantry over here. I got fluff. I'm going to make a fluffer another sandwich for lunch. <laughs> like, I get distracted really easily. Nice. So, uh, well, well right. you know, we're, I'm used to doing this with you guys for an hour and a half every time, <laughs> like, or an hour. So it's just, yeah. yeah. Well, speaking about 15 minute intros, we're <laughs> solid 10 minutes in right now, nine minutes and 50 seconds right now. So let's, uh, let's get into this. Let's just jump right into the, 
the meat of the uh, of the podcast today. Yeah. So who wants to? I was, about, I was gonna say, tell us what you got. All you right. want me go I, first or no, Steve? I'll, Steve, I'll go first. All right. Uh, this first. this article was actually uh, emailed to me from the formatting formula. Believe it or not, <laughs> they said, "Hey, you should check this out for your podcast." I was like, "Ah, oh, thank you so much. This is great." So uh, a 313 year old fossil footprint was found at Grand Canyon National Park. Damn, and 313 is, million. What did I say? You said 313. Oh, it's three, yeah, it's three, three, it's, 13 million, million. <laughs> no, it, it's, it's not from colonial times. <laughs> uh, Lewis and Clark's footprints were yeah. found. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. sorry. Continue. I didn't no, <laughs> thank you. That, that was a good catch. 313 million year old fossil footprints are found at Grand Canyon. The yeah. oldest of their kind found at the park. Um, you know, which th- this in itself is an interesting story. But what kind of takes it to the next level is there, uh, there was this visiting professor from Norway at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, uh, who was taking students out on a field trip. And this, there was just this boulder, like, you know, the, the cliff had weathered and, and a piece of the cliff fell down. And this boulder had been sitting there. They don't really know for how long. It wasn't too long, but long enough where somebody should have noticed it. Uh-huh. And this visiting professor was like, hey, look what's on this boulder. <laughs> and it turns out to be like some of the oldest vertebrate tracks in the Grand Canyon, all because this guy opened his eyes and noticed something different. So that goes to show you like sometimes a fresh perspective, some dude coming all the way from Norway, traveling this same, you know, I, we, we've all, or at least I have, been on field trips where you've been on it like nine times because you, you took it as a student or you're teaching it or you know whatever like you've been on the field trip the same field trip multiple times you may miss something like this so it's pretty cool that this this visiting professor from Norway saw this and noted it and you know it basically wrote a paper on it it's, it's pretty freaking cool but I don't know how many, how many professors from the University of Nevada are kicking themselves for having walked past this, you know, countless times and not noticed it. So that that's something that I found to be cool. And, and that's what's great about science is that, you know, it, it could be something as simple as walking past a boulder and seeing it, you know, with a fresh pair of eyes for the first time. Yeah. How many times are you out in an outcrop and like, you're out there for a few hours and then you see you see a feature and then it's like you see it everywhere after that yes oh then, yeah right even when you leave and then you come back and you're like i remember it's here somewhere and it takes mm-hmm. till you actually see it to see it yeah or you're there and you're there for like the 10th time and some student is like hey i think i found a cool fossil and it's like the greatest fossil of all time and you're like <laughs> yeah. son of a <laughs> it's like some freshman who doesn't even care about it like i'm not sure if i want to take this home or not i'm like well let me know if you don't yeah because <laughs> i will take it um yeah no, that's nothing I'll that's just... nothing carefully put it in the back of the van please yes. <laughs> wrap that in tissue man. <laughs> so these these footprints they found at the grand canyon are the earliest evidence of vertebrates walking on sand dunes yeah and so, I like to think of them as walking hand in hand. Yeah. Or on a date. Yeah. Did, did, you, did, you say that there's, did you mention that there was two of them? I don't, I don't know. No, I didn't. I didn't. Oh, Sorry. Okay. But yeah, there was, there was two, they think it was two sets of uh, I do, footprints. I do like how that's very specific. Like the earliest vertebrate, vertebrate fossil footprints on sand dunes <laughs> on the Southwest of Laurentia. Yeah, <laughs> but it, uh, they think they were egg laying. Is that what I? That, it says yeah. egg laying. I don't know how you can tell that by the footprint. I mean, there yeah, again, I mean that sort of makes sense because that's what we're thinking. These early like tetrapods and reptile esque organisms coming from the water, the sea. Yeah, I mean it makes sense. I just wasn't sure. You know, paleontologists can figure out like. Oh, so they, they used to. So they say. I guess, yeah. So, you know, they have all uh, kinds of evidence. Like, oh, based on that skull structure, they used to crush, you know, baby storks with their 
yeah. back of their teeth, but actually use the front of their teeth <laughs> for, for eating the grass. Stork brain. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it's, it's very specific based on just some weird, little weird way a muscle attaches to something else. And that they're much, much smarter than me. And I will take their word for it. So, because apparently other people do. Not, not to say that that's what you should just do. Blindly faith, faith, trust, whatever you want to call it. Uh, scientists, but I'd like to think that they've gone through the rigors of scientific publishing and it's been, you know, gone through reviews and all that jazz. You guys know more than I do. Just stop me anytime here. And I'll just keep no. going. No, no, you just keep <laughs> on going. I'm enjoying this. Just, this is good. <laughs> let us know how it works, Steve. Just, uh... <laughs> Steve Stoop. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, that's all I got. Yeah. So... I, I've, I have published, but I'm lucky enough to publish with other people who do 99% of the work and graciously put my name on it. Don't sell yourself short. You're right. It's like 98.9% of the work. Like 1.1%. Per, 1. 1%. Well, I'll, I'll so, do, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, I'm sorry, just to get back to these footprints. So that 330 million years ago, oh, so you said 300, was it 330 or 13? 313 million years ago. 13, all right. So that means, so just to give you a, a sense for where we're at in geologic time, 313 puts us in the Carboniferous period. And um, so what was going on on Earth around that time, Pangea had come together. Usually um, the estimates for when Pangea first, like, you know, all the continents collided together is about 335 million years ago. So Pangea was together for about, yeah, let's just say rounded to like 15 million years or so. And, um, and, then, these, uh, and then we had these tracks from these reptiles walking around. Yeah, the, that's the all same. I wanted to add. No, but the, <laughs> give a uh, context for what was going on when. Uh... And it's called the Carboniferous because the the most of the landmass was kind of near the equator, and there was lots of swamps and lots of plants and things, and you know that that's where a lot of our coal deposits come from. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jesse. Yes. Nope, that is correct. <laughs> so that's know? why they call it the Carboniferous because yeah. there's so much carbon. My the Pennsylvanian is my favorite of all the stages. I think the Pennsylvanian's a stage, right? I believe it is. Yeah. Mine's the Mississippian, which makes this uh, conversation or is, Oh no, it's a period. Sorry. Well, the I Pennsylvania the Pennsylvanian's weird because it's not recognized by European geologists. Am I correct with saying that? Uh, you the, are correct. You are, yeah. It, it's why, not, that's it why is, I hold it, a grudge. That's why yeah. I said Mississippian, because the Mississippian isn't either. The Pennsylvania and Mississippian, I think, are blocked together. They yeah, are it's international, it. and I forget yeah. what they call it. So Pennsylvania. Um, I'm looking at the, the United States geologic time scale, and it's got the you know Pennsylvania and Mississippian periods on there, but... It also puts um, the Carboniferous, which is... Yeah, so Mississippian's older, yeah. Pennsylvania's younger. Yeah, but this would be. I guess, or would they, when they, so I never. There are they considered sub periods? Like the Carboniferous is the period. Um. Yeah. Yeah. You would. I guess you would. I think that's where we're at. Is that a nomenclature? Epic? It's not an epoch. No, the Carboniferous no. would be the period. Yeah. But what's the sub period? The sub period would be Mississippi and, and Pennsylvania. That's how I always right. But is that called an epoch or an eon? No. No. Period. Not eon. Uh, Okay, sub period. I'll take your word for it. I forget. The, Carb the Carboniferous is the period. Right. Pennsylvania, Mississippi, and are sub periods, and they're part of the Paleozoic era. 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 Phanerozoic eon. Phanerozoic eon. Thank you. So Fun facts. Fun eon facts. era period stage. Stage. That, that maybe. Period, I'm sorry. That's that's what I was epic, thinking. and then age. <laughs> Sorry, it gets really yeah uh, down into the nitty gritty. This is what people Most tune in for. Yeah, yeah. Just um, that and nomenclature of the geologic time scale. We have been getting requests to redo our podcast on the geologic time scale. We should. I don't know if people know what they're going to get themselves into if we I, do a uh, another podcast on the geologic time scale. Uh, stage boundaries are really interesting. 
Well, you know what there we I could do? Um, we could do a podcast. We could actually do some research on this and do the history of the geologic time scale yeah. and how we there were research, re- <laughs> research <laughs> playoffs. <laughs> practice. Our, our normal. this but I, I thought i read something like there was originally like four time periods in the geologic time scale is that so there oh, was something you're, like, you're getting back into the the nitty-gritty the, the very 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 beginning and yeah i yeah. like where you're going but i don't i don't have a great understanding of like the super early time scale wasn't that um, like there was the like we're in the quaternary period right now but yeah. so it was like four tertiary was um was was it i don't know the, the name oh geez I'm, I'm screwing this up i don't know i don't know if i want to talk in, there's something about uh it's when you realize like back in the day when they originally thought there was like like whatever like four oh, time periods oh i get what you're saying yeah so like we're in the quaternary that's i mean <clears throat> the previous um era epic was the tertiary and that's why we call it the KT boundary where the dinosaurs died, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. Uh-huh. But I don't, yeah, so they divide it into four sections. But yeah, we should, we, should, we should revisit this. Let's put it on the whiteboard. Maybe we'll make that a topic for Ooh, I like it. next episode. Yeah, and there's, there's uh, yeah, I got, I got to look into this more. But there's something yeah. about like, or there's something like the Triassic period was the third period, and well, that's so in the Mesozoic, which is middle life. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. Separated, and into, that's literally what Mesozoic translates into yeah. is middle life. Yeah, and, and it's separated into three periods, which <laughs> is uh, Triassic, yeah, <clears throat> Jurassic, and Cretaceous. But the Jurassic is named after the Jura Mountains, and Cretaceous mm-hmm. is the Latin for chalk because you get the chalk cliffs. Crater, it's it. No, no, it's it's from. Oh, it's I thought from, this all had to do with Lord of the Rings. <laughs> no. no, so chalk, um, it, it's uh, it's Latin for crater. Oh, you were saying crater, right? Crater, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, I thought you were saying craton. I was like, no, not craton. <laughs> Cratons. <laughs> you're so you're so wrong. <laughs> you're way off. <laughs> Samsonite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it's all super interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, oh, shoot. I'm, and I'm learning things right now. The, yeah. Huh. No, I'm going to save this for next week. Get ready. I'm reading oh, about man. the Triassic, the often overlooked Triassic in my book. Oh, wow. There, I said it. Well, all right, Lynn. We'll, we'll, we'll do this. Uh, we'll do this next week. We'll do some homework and, uh, yeah. Well, all right, it will do it live. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh shoot, the Triassic is when the the uh, Tanny Strophius lived, which was that. What's that? They're they're just talking about it. It's just in the news, and I forget why, but it's that crazy like sea creature, or, or maybe it's a. It was on land too, but it has the really long neck and the tiny tiny body. And they're like, how did this thing swim? Oh, that was in the news recently, right? Yeah. They didn't, this thing had like a crazy, ridiculous neck, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Anywho. So what was it? How big was I? Because I, I didn't look into the story, but I saw that there was some, um, they were yeah, talking about, I they mean, finally was, figured out like about this, this animal. It, it was like 20 feet long and over nine feet of it is neck. So over half of it is, is just neck. Which, wow. How did it breathe? How did it swallow? How did it move? Um, and so they, they think they've, they've, they've done some modeling here. Um, and they found ribs underneath the neck vertebrae that were interlocking um, to, to sort of, I don't know, create, create, an extremely stiff neck. 
Hmm. This is, is this, yeah, I'm sorry. I know you just said this a couple seconds ago with the, the canny strophius. Yeah. Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I found it. Um, yeah. The thing's huge. It actually came on the land to lay eggs, but it was an overall, that's crazy. It had a 20 foot long neck, but wow. Yeah. And like, uh, it came in the, it came in a big form in a miniature form. Hmm. We should link, uh, I'm just looking at a, it's like a GI Joe article here from the New York Times where they do a graphic and it's they put a, like a scuba diver next to it and you can see how big it is. <laughs> kind, of, kind of crazy. Um, phew, man, oh man. It hunted fish and squid. So they think looking at their teeth again, paleontologist man. Yeah, crazy. Just. Yeah, it, while the smaller species' teeth pointed to a diet of marine invertebrates such as shrimp. Huh. What? Shrimp's pretty tasty, I'm not going to lie. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah if it's between. That. That's why they went on land, so they could cook them over the barbecue. Ah. Put another shrimp on the barbie. Yeah. Shrimp cocktail. I'm telling you. Hey, we got to get our subscribership up in Australia. So I just that's right. to throw that in there. Right. <laughs> that's really interesting. Um uh, yeah. Huh. Huh. You're per- perplexed right now, aren't you? I, it's just, it's, uh, it's just weird, man. Some of these old animals just really, they're just goofy. Like, <laughs> what, what's going on there? What are you guys thinking? <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Evolutions. I don't know. You think uh-huh. like maybe like, you know, 50 million years from now, people, uh, whatever's on earth. We'll look back on people and be like, what are these weird animals? You know, just the purpose here of this. Yeah, why would they have taken all the carbon and just turned it into different carbon and then distributed <laughs> it all over the entire planet they, they to kill themselves? They just excreted plastic everywhere. We don't know yeah. how they developed this. Yeah. Yeah. Probably came out of the appendix. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Organ that we don't know what. Well, that's, that's why I got my appendix out. I'm trying to live plastic free. Got there you go. Good for you, buddy. Yeah. So that's how the man about... tracks us. The, <laughs> the appendix. Yeah. That's that's what I said. So, speaking of mass extinction events, let's move on to uh, <laughs> it's, it's good good uh, good segue to our next news story we have there. See, what I did there. I, I saw this opportunity and I jumped on it. It was a very for, it was a forced segue. Yeah. It was, uh, it was uh, like beautiful. shut up. I'm going. <laughs> beautiful, seamless. Carry on, Chris. Yeah, we're getting into our conspiracy theories about the appendix tracking us. Yeah, and uh, Sasquatch. Ah, uh, yep. Here, uh, at, at, here at the Geology Flannel Cast, you know, we really pride ourselves on flawless <laughs> transitions. Um, That's the okay. we do two things really well: staying on ta- topic and mm-hmm. transitioning. Yes. What were we talking about? What? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there is this new article out. Uh, it's pretty, yeah, this just came out a couple of days ago. Um, talking about the late Devonian uh, extinction. So one of the things I, you know, I, whenever I, I teach about these mass extinction events, it's always, you know, I always teach my students that it's it's not an easy task to figure out what caused a mass extinction. A lot of this stuff is like, you know, you, uh, there's, there's just so many different factors going on. And it's just one of those things like trying to figure out, like, was it one factor that caused um, a mass extinction? And the other thing we talk about mass extinctions is, um, you know, every, like, I, geez, we must talk about the, uh, the mass extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous period that took out the dinosaurs, and the KT event. We, I think we talk about this like literally every week in the podcast. KPG. But oh, the KPG, if you want to be, yeah, that's what they're calling it now. Um, the, more up to, accurate, the more up to date. Which is what we yes, strive for. Accuracy. Strive for accuracy here. <laughs> but uh, that's one of the, like from what we're seeing, that's kind of one of the, kind of like the anomaly where it really was one like specific and it was like, Boom, you can kind of pinpoint it. Like, okay, there was there was a an asteroid that slammed into Earth. But so there's a And even that has controversy. That even has controversy, yeah. And there's still, yeah, there's a couple yeah, different parties that kind of think different things, but I think the vast majority of out there kind of think it was the 
the asteroid that slammed into Earth. But there's a new article out talking about the uh, Devonian, the mass extinction event that took, um, that occurred at the end of the Devonian, or at the boundary of the Devonian Cretaceous periods. And there's a new paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that suggests that this mass extinction event at the Devonian Carboniferous boundary might have been linked to a nearby supernova. So it's kind of a thinking outside of the box, you know? So uh, the Devonian, the boundary between the Devonian period and the Carboniferous period is at 358 million years ago, 358.9 if you wanna be um, exact. And so these, um, these people that published this, uh, these scientists that published, were looking at this, uh, at, like I said, that, that boundary in the rock record, and they noticed that the rock contained uh, malformed plant spores that appear to be sunburned by ultraviolet light. All right, and what does that mean? You know that they're sunburned. Well, it it appears that these plant spores were uh, th that. They, they basically got sunburned by this ultraviolet light as a result of there was some sort of, some type of long-lasting ozone depletion event. So the ozone layer kind of goes away for a little bit and kind of bakes the sun, or bakes the sun, excuse me, I didn't mean to say that, bakes the earth in ultraviolet light, all right? So, okay, what, what can cause that? And so um, you look at things like, uh, you know, there's like large-scale volcanism, global warming, that can destroy the ozone layer as well, but the evidence is kind of inconclusive for um, the time interval for over um, how those things occur. So in order, they're, in this paper, they're kind of looking at, they're suggesting that not only was there potentially one supernova, that there could have been multiple supernovas um, that happened that kind of took away the ozone layer of the earth. And the hypothesis is that these super, I don't know how they figured this out. This is actually pretty crazy, but the hypothesis is that they figured the supernova occurred about 65 light years away from. Um, so uh, I don't know, what do, you, what do you guys, you guys, you guys buy this idea? I know it's kind of like a, um, kind of like outside the box thinking this that the you know trying to it, tie it and you know it is so, go ahead jesse go uh, i was gonna i was just gonna say the <clears throat> convent can i give the conventional thinking and then we can compare the two do yeah. it so <clears throat> the devonian is oftentimes the devonian has sort of two extinction events um there's one that occurs <clears throat> over a period um, ab about 360 million years ago called the, it's called the Franzian Femenian boundary. So it's these, Three, 372. Yeah, these stages. But it, yeah, it's, but it's, the, the extinction itself is not abrupt. It's sort of this, almost like smeared. And that's, that's called the FF boundary. Um, it's, it's sometimes called the Kelvasser event. Now, the end of Onian into the Carboniferous that you're talking about is um, called the Hangenberger, uh, Hang, Hangenberg event. And so it's marked by basically <clears throat> you find all these really black shales. So that tells us that the water, the ocean water became really anoxic and so sort of the, the leading idea here of why this is happening is the, ex, the expansion of plant life on land. So, so the Devonian is when you get plants evolving on land. And what happens when, when these, these plants are on land, not only does it drive down CO2, so you see a glacial event going on here as well. Okay. You have all these plants that are on land now and when they die, or not even when they die, as they're growing on land, they actually alter the, the, the chemistry of, of what they're growing on. And they're basically, there's phosphorus production. 
and that gets washed into the waters now, like the oceans, and it causes these algal blooms because algae loves phosphorus. It's why mm -hmm. if you buy detergent for your washing machine, it's all mostly phosphate and phosphorus free. Mm -hmm. It's because when you wash that down the drain, they don't want it going into the into the your waterways because it causes algal blooms. Algal blooms by themselves aren't bad, but algae has a very it doesn't live very long. And so you get this huge algal bloom when it dies, all of that algae then starts to break down, bacteria breaks it down and it uses oxygen. And so these algal blooms uh, lead to um, what's called eutrophication. So you get either hypoxic or even anoxic where there's little to no oxygen left. Uh -huh. That sort of conforms with these dark black shales where you just have all this organic material that dies and then doesn't necessarily get decomposed. It just, it just sort of breaks down. So that's sort of our, our leading idea is that the expansion of land organisms. I haven't read this paper about the supernovas triggering the end of Onian. I think it's really interesting, but I also think like it's one of those cases, I don't want to be a skeptic. Yeah, it's well, how do you prove it? Well, and since I you asked how you prove it, I have the answer of how to prove it. Um, you so up, you get a death star and you blow up another star. <laughs> <laughs> See if it fries the spores. Star on, killer base. On a third star. Well, what you want to do is the key to proving if this was a supernova that basically took out the ozone layer and bathed the earth in UV radiation is you look for the isotopes of plutonium-244 and samarium-146. Gotopes is right. Um, so you look for that in the rocks and fossils from this time. So neither of those isotopes on Earth occur naturally today. And so the only way that you can get those isotopes on Earth is via a cosmic explosion. So, I just... Is that really the only way, or, uh, yeah. or was I something mean, going I, on on our surface three hundred million years? No. Ago? Well, here's the deal. Well, let me let me finish this. So, right. um, they they haven't started to look for those. I oh, son of a! <laughs> I was I was gonna. I thought you were gonna promote because I was gonna be like, it seems like an overly complex explanation for something that there's a much simpler explanation. I mean. Yeah, like the environment uh, it, changed rapidly and things couldn't keep up. You know and, what, though? I mean, I, I think that I like, I like that they're thinking outside the box. I do, too. No, I, think I get that, too. Cause I, I think it's cool. Wasn't there a dark matter theory right around the same time? I mean, that we had a that podcast was, about this years ago. Yeah. Where yeah. somebody yeah. Black hypothesized that uh, uh, dark, dark matter. matter yeah. I, uh, it's like the, uh, wave you remember, or something. Um, it's like the original Cosmos with Carl Sagan, where he does the episode on Tanguska. We, sh we showed it in our one class. When, when you were my TA, Chris, we showed it. Remember when he's, he's standing in, in Tanguska and he's like, maybe it was spaceships, but there's not one hint of a transistor that was found. <laughs> maybe, it was, maybe it was a tiny black hole that passed through or antimatter or something. So he's got all these sort mm -hmm. of crazy ideas. And he's mm -hmm, like, yeah. mm -hmm. Well, it's probably just a comet, and it exploded midair, and that's. Uh, it. Carl was just really high when he was saying that, <laughs> and uh, just, wouldn't that be hey. crazy, guys? Like, it, don't it don't is, you badmouth Carl Sagan. I know. I, I don't talk ill will of the dead. I know it's, that. But. <laughs> it's an incredible scene, though, because he's like going over like this. I don't remember this at all. Um, <laughs> I'll find I, I, I've never seen Cosmos. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, no, <clears throat> it's it's great because there's like this because it ha is 1906 so there's like old-timey russian music playing and he's he's got his turtleneck and blazer on and he's going through like this god bless exploded landscape and it's incredible just really so maybe well, maybe it was a black hole passed through the earth no i, I i'm all for these outside the box thinkings i'm not uh i i I'm open-minded is what I'm saying. I, I just need a little bit more, especially for the, for the time period. Like it, it's, it's too far away 
to really pinpoint that stuff. But if there really is UV scorching and things like that, like I feel like there's a, a like Jesse said, a million other simpler reasons other than a supernova. And I don't know if supernovas leave some sort of radio signature or something like that after they explode and we can figure well, that out. the whole thing is you're trying to come up with a way to yeah figure out why there was this dramatic drop in stratospheric ozone i'm, I'm reading the abstract right now of the paper no, no and I, I get that but how do you Probably like i understand there's there's a radio signature from like what happened at the big bang 13 billion years ago you know there, there nobel prizes have been won for this but which the physics of that I still can't really comprehend like how, how some sort of noise in a radio signal someone figured out oh that's the background radiation from the big bang like what how do you, what yeah but everyone seems to agree that that's true so maybe the supernova theory is correct i just need to i just need a little more you know first i should probably read the paper <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's more, and then after that maybe i do think we could have a whole thing because it's like a, it's a very interesting thought experiment and i i kind of like that it would have been great if they would have included an uh, <clears throat> a geologist on it it's all all of the authors are they just astrophysicists or physicists yeah all physicists there's one it looks like one ecologist um so it'd be it's sort of interesting an ecologist maybe, that's interesting yeah i guess that's where they come in with the plant spores maybe i don't know but yeah it's all physicists um <sighs> yeah it's i do like thought experiments but you know what do they say? What's the thing about exceptional things? Oh, uh, exceptional claims call for exceptional evidence. Yeah, extraordinary so claims call for extraordinary evidence. Yeah, that's that's another Carl Sagan quote right there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Show so, me. show me the supernova. Show me the money. Well, not only that, but they're saying. Well, I guess because they're uh, they're talking about multiple super supernovae. Yeah. Just, what's the? Yeah, that's like. Eh, not one would do it, but two. Because it two. seems like they no, talked I think it's about Novas. how long... Supernovas? Supernovas? I don't know. If, if, if I saw three Chevys on the street, I would say, hey, there's three Chevy Novas. <laughs> Chevy, Chevy Novas? Uh, I do like that there's a zone <clears throat> within a supernova called the kill distance. Yeah, did you see the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Whoopsies>. <laughs> Uh, by the way, you can say either supernovae or supernovas. Ah, good to know. One is uh, wrong and one is right. <laughs> <laughs> either or, so whatever, whatever floats you both there. But yeah, the, the kill distance. So that means, uh, I guess, that if you're close enough to a star that's supernovas, then you're kind of SOL. That's, that's, uh, uh, I've got a movie idea to pitch to the rock. Oh. I mean, oh yeah, called Kill Distance. <laughs> <laughs> you get The Rock and Bruce Willis in it at the same time. Oh, oh the the perfect. Yeah, Kill Distance. Uh, wait, what's the happening. premise? Do they have to like put a, a, a shield of like a Faraday cage around Earth yeah, to save maybe. us? Yeah, we gotta protect ourselves from the ozone depleting. Well, that might be the. I haven't uh, worked out. We got to storyboard this a little more, but yeah. But I'm I in. Just, I'm in. I mean, I'm already in. <laughs> yeah, I want to get it out there in the ether. So if anyone steals it, we've got a timestamp on this. I don't know. Hollywood tends to s steal stuff. Yeah, no, they won't call it kill distance. They'll call it like death range. Oh. They'll just like change the words. No, let's change it to that. I like that better. Ah, son of a. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh yeah it's interesting all right i'm on board all right kill zone we'll see we'll keep you guys posted on how this uh this yeah. hypothesis um evolves over time yeah see if it's uh has any reproducibility yeah we'll see if it 
Find us that plutonium in uh, Sima- what was that? Samanium? Samarium? Samarium? Isotope, yeah. Did, uh, plutonium. Does plutonium occur naturally? I thought it was. I, I Man, you're think talking it about does. Person. There must be something. I mean, like, no, there must uh, be the, some isotope of plutonium no. on Earth. Yeah, but 244 must be the weird one that doesn't occur yeah. naturally on Earth. Uh, oh, I'm only, I'm vaguely remembering the picture of a periodic table and the elements that are outlined not fully black are the ones that are not naturally occurring and i believe plutonium is naturally occurring but it looks like they use uh at least in the bombs he's 239 well yeah but it was, was it's this? This part was... of the chain reaction from uranium though i think it's an offshoot i think you i think we have to produce Anyway, uh, they, they're looking for 244 in the bombs used 239. Yeah. I don't know what else to tell you. I don't know anything else about <laughs> nuclear bombs. You seem to know an awful lot about an atomic bomb. <laughs> <laughs> she just put you on a list right there. Uh, this is just Google it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's where you went wrong. Yeah. A- I should have used like DuckDuckGo for that one, right? Yeah. <laughs> Safe search on. Um, I, it's interesting. Let's hope that it doesn't collapse under its own weight and implode. See what I did there? Yes. That's how supernovas work. I like it. Oh. <laughs> Come on, man. That was good. <laughs> I, I liked it, Jesse. Well, thank you. <laughs> you laughed at that joke. Email jesse at jesse <laughs> at chalgyflannelcast.com. Ah. Uh. Yeah. I'm trying. I'm looking up periodic table of elements. I'm trying to find one that <laughs> has the the same configuration that I'm used to. Where the you've got non- mean, what configuration? Nothing's changed. The, the last non naturally occurring years. ones. The non naturally occurring ones are denoted somehow, and I, I seriously can't find it, which is maddening because I have one upstairs. I'll, I might have to go run upstairs and find it. <laughs> wow a periodic t- table of elements by price i but saw like, one by abundance the other day oh what's uh, you know the um the was it the chemist that came up i don't i forget the name i should Mendelev. Uh, is he the one that came, yeah. yeah he came up with the, the periodic table of elements happened in a dream he dreamed it up and it was just really? like oh this is this is crazy i gotta i should do this so not naturally occurring Sorry, plutonium. You do realize it, it, it says it's not, not naturally occurring. Plutonium naturally occurring. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like neptonium, plutonium, americium, uh, berkelium, californium, einsteinium. No, yeah. Yeah. So plutonium right. generally so plutonium isn't plutonium naturally is not, occurring. Right. Uh, the trace elements I, come from uranium. I apologize. Um, I actually, I, I didn't know anything about plutonium before. Yeah, this I, I, I thought it was. Uh, uranium byproduct <clears throat> trust me i've looked into this yeah Wink. Uh, yeah plutonium is a byproduct of the nuclear power industry you know, i'm reading about uh plutonium 244 right now and it's really interesting in how it comes from stars like and you do get it in nucleosynthesis and supernova new nuve Huh. You find it in traces of bastonite, which is, get this, a carbonate fluoride mineral. Hmm. That's a new one. Carbonate fluoride. Carbonate fluoride. Good for them. (laughs) Man, this rock is weird. It's got it's got lanthanum, ceruleum, and yttrium in it. Hmm. But that's like the long-necked animal. You're like, how did this thing get here? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Those uh, rare earth elements. There's like some island off of the coast of like Sweden, Sweden or something, where like ninety percent of them come from. Yeah, it's you know, all of like the, the, the yttrium and iridium, ubidium, all of those crazy Y ones. Is that uh, was there an impact there? Is that what brought them all here? Aliens back full circle back to aliens. Full circle. It's a weird um 
it's like a weird cave where they where they they're all found yeah it's it's kind of crazy very cool huh yttrium is found in the isle of yttri <laughs> <laughs> no i'm serious the island of yttri is where yttrium I, is yeah. found it's it's found in in terms of edible plants in the largest amount in cabbage wow 100 parts per million in cabbage 100 parts per million that's a lot yeah so wow. that's next the, next time you're eating your coleslaw just <laughs> yeah the cabbage industry should really be like yeah okay. daily Yo, guys yttrium. you need your daily yttrium <laughs> yeah you want to you want to be special eat some rare earth metals <laughs> please do not eat rare earth metals <laughs> it will ki- it will kill you you will die just, just keep you know, neodymium magnets this podcast does not endorse eating <laughs> rare earth metals this podcast took a turn we did not script yeah. any of this stuff no. this, this tangent alright you guys ready for one last one last story here yeah, yeah. All let's right. do it to it this is a good one. Hit me with it. Let's talk about the moon. You guys are familiar with the moon? Jesse was just talking about how oh, he was man. staring at the moon, just like, you know, getting back to his old roots before humans had electricity and actually just stared at the stars and the moon. Yeah. I mean, I was using a, a fancy telescope. Suck it, Galileo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Galileo had a telescope, though. Yeah, but mine is much better. Oh, all right. Yeah. He probably made his own. He did. And which... it's, it's actually really awesome. Yeah. You know, when the, the, they had a replica of it at the Franklin Institute a couple of years ago. Yeah. Badass. But do you ever see the, the, they've done recreations of pictures of what he would see, like using it? Mm-hmm. Straight garbage. Just fuzz. Yeah. <laughs> I don't well, know. Well, how about I mean, this? They're not great. Until you make your own telescope from scratch. Suck it, Thornburg. Right? Uh, <laughs> yep, you got me. It goes to Galileo. Uh, you know, it's I wouldn't have that telescope if not for Galileo. Yeah, he was like uh, OG. He 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 really did it. He really went for it. What he he discovered a bunch of moons in Jupiter. He did or, a lot of around. Things. I know he yeah. did a lot of things. He did a lot of yeah, Jupiter's moons. He's also born on his birthday is December twenty. That's right. Uh yes. Uh no. February fifteenth. He died on January eighth, which maybe was, maybe it was uh someone else. Sorry. Yeah, maybe Kepler. One of them. There are so many of those early New- ones. Maybe Isaac Newton. Oh, uh, I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, yeah, I think it was. <laughs> Yeah, but I December twenty fifth, sixteen forty two. Isaac Newton. So he died, or he's born? He, he's dead. You know, he's not. What? Why didn't anyone tell me? <laughs> oh God! I didn't even send flowers. This is this is how you break it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I... Turns out we're actually three of us are vampires, so we've been around since fourteenth <laughs> century. Yeah, Gail Galileo did some. He did phases, showing Venus had phases, sort of going in with a heliocentric model, sunspots. Oh man, he looked at the, he did the moon. It was the first. What did he, what did he look at the moon? Do you have that in front of you? 1609, but the, he wasn't the first person. Thomas Harriot, who was an English mathematician, um, was the first person he did it in July of 1609 Galileo did it in November of 1609 uh so what what were they looking at the moon and they just have these drawings showing like the the mare and the you know the the highlands and the lowlands the basalt fields but um yeah that's interesting huh how about that well um, this guy, Thomas Harriet, died in Roanoke, it looks like. No. Virginia? Virginia? Yeah. He was, <laughs> he was at Roanoke, and then he came back. Hmm. 
but he discussed optics, optics with Kepler. Huh, this is interesting. History, the history of this stuff is very interesting. So back to the moon. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, it, man. Interesting book, Jesse, The Philosopher's Breakfast Club. Huh? I've heard of that one. It's, it's a very good book. Oh, uh, oh. Good, good friend of the show, Mark Zirdin, recommended it. Very good. Huh. I'm, I just started reading one about the end of the universe. Um, that is so far good. How uh, does it end? Everything burns out? Well, it, entropy. Spoiler alert. Spoiler yeah. alert. Entropy. Heat death. Yeah, entropy. Yeah. The, the big freeze. Uh, it's by Brian Cox, who not Brian. Oh Cox. yeah, 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 yeah. I've, I've been meaning actually, yeah, I've been meaning to um, to read that book. Yeah, yeah Brian Cox. He's yeah, he's the yeah. astrophysicist. Mm-hmm. Um, um, all right, all right. So, let's, so let's, the let's, moon. What about the moon, moon, Chris? So we've talked about this in the podcast before in the past. The moon. That the moon. We talked about the moon a couple times. The moon's drifting away, right? And I think we 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 uh, we talked about the numbers. It's like a, basically the the. The we, the moon's getting further and further away from the Earth. We know that uh, you never and, come around as much as you used to. No, I mean it's, it's out just about every night. You can see it, <laughs> <laughs> except, except for those one night a month when it's yeah. I mean it's there. It's just kind it just of like doesn't show be, up at all. Being a creeper, just hiding. You know, <laughs> yeah, hiding yeah, in the dark. There, good point. I can see yeah. you, but you can't see me <laughs> in, the, in the shadows. <laughs> So we talked about how the moon's moving away from the earth. And there's all sorts of uh, cool things that we can see. Um, and so in the geologic record, like way back, like hundreds of millions of years ago, um, you can actually, there's evidence that the tidal range was much larger than it is today because the moon controls tides. So when the moon was closer to earth, the high tides were higher and the low tides were lower. And um, there was a, um, a, a larger tidal range. Fun fact, but the moon is uh, drifting away, and, and um, it's moved so far away from the Earth. Like I said, you can actually see it in the at its range in the geologic record. All right. Cool. So every year, the moon gets about an inch and a half away from us, and that's you think about it. That's uh, that's about as fast as the Atlantic Ocean is spreading open. The Atlantic Ocean was it like two centimeters yeah, or so? That's yeah. Uh, it's like two um, and a so, half inches a year, but yeah, yeah. No, I no no. You're right. Uh, two and a half centimeters a year. So yeah, you're right. About about an inch, inch and a half. Um, so and actually, uh, fun little fact. I'm reading this. There was an article in the New York Times uh, about. So the moon's leaving us, and Europe's leaving us. Everyone's just going away. Good gracious. <laughs> It's COVID. You don't want to be near anybody. The moon's <laughs> too soon. I just I want to jump in here. It was Brian Green who wrote the book, not Brian Cox. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, he's another excellent uh, physicist. Yeah, it's, it's good. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so fun little fact about the moon in this New York Times article. Um, hundreds of millions of years from now, our moon will be so far away from the Earth that there will be no more total solar eclipses. Oh. Yeah, I never, never really thought about that, but makes sense, you know. Yeah, it makes sense. But the moon won't fully exit our orbit for like a trillion years or something. The sun's gonna, the sun's Long gonna engulf us sun. all. Yeah. yeah so, uh, yeah, if they, if we wrote it out, yeah, mm-hmm. till death do us part, moon. That's right. Yeah. So let's um, let's go back in time a little bit to the. Um, the Apollo missions back in the uh, late '60s and '70s. I was a big fan, big fan of those missions. Big fan of the Apollo. Who who didn't like that? Like what? Uh, who was out there was like, ah, those Apollo astronauts. They're full yeah, of that's crap. a big waste of money. <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, you know? There had to be someone very un, very cynical and unimpressed about landing on the moon. Come on, <laughs> on the moon, right? The moon. Uh, there there is more computing power in your cell phone now than the entire NASA had when we landed on the moon. Uh, hello. It's because Kubrick directed that footage of great point. Great point. 
I don't believe in that. All right. Um, I'm glad you had the guts to put that on the record. <laughs> <laughs> um, coincidentally, I just watched uh, 2001 Space Odyssey just about a, like a week or two ago. Yeah. And it was, I'll tell you what, they nailed a lot of things about the year 2000. Um, or at least pretty close to the year 2000. It was it was really interesting. Some really interesting sci-fi. Uh, some things they kind of really the swing into this, you know. But uh, <laughs> uh, they uh, the one one thing they really nailed in 2001: Space Odyssey about what's going on today is basically FaceTime, like video video conferencing. Mm -hmm. And they had all sorts of like, you know, it was yeah. the 1960s version of of you know video yeah. what a video call would look like. But it's like yeah, it's, I, I guess two, 2000 they didn't really didn't. We didn't have FaceTime in 2000, but yeah. it's only off by like 10 years, though. Yeah, so, but I was just about to say, it's 2001 Space Odyssey, not 2020 Space Odyssey. <laughs> I was going to say he was way off. <laughs> now, if he could, if he had me in baggy clothes and long hair, <laughs> yes. yes. Listening to Limp Bizkit and Corn. Yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, let's, where we talked about before we started about uh, Blink-182. Yes. And then what's his face? Tom DeLong. Yeah. 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 Exposing yeah. aliens. Aliens, man. Aliens. All right. All right. So back, why am I talking about the moon? I'm not talking about like, there's just about these, uh, these fun facts. So uh, the I, Apollo astronauts put down these um, uh, light reflecting panels so that we could measure the exact distance that the moon was retreating away from the earth using lasers. Lasers. lasers all types of lasers yeah so um they have five of these uh they call them uh retro reflectors the apollo astronauts put up on there and uh and there's two uh soviet rovers up there as well they use this for and so what they'll do is they'll shoot a laser beam and they'll count how long it takes for that light to leave um I don't know, the gun that's shooting, what do you call that? Yeah. Uh, it's not a gun. gun like, whatever. It is. It, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the emitter your, and the receiver. The emitter, okay, yeah. 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 And uh, you basically, you know, start a, start a stopwatch. We know how fast, it, you know, uh, the speed of light is. And it takes There's a two, Big Bang Theory episode about this. There's, <laughs> they sit on oh, the Oh, there is one, they, yeah, yeah. They, they shoot a laser and they calculate the time it comes back. And it, it's funny, it's like, they shoot it, it's like, and now it's back. Like it's literally like a second and a half or something like that. Well, it takes two and a half seconds for the. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Get, you know, plus or minus. <laughs> <laughs> so what's happening is these things are becoming uh, uh, they're they're not they're not as accurate anymore, and there's a lot of dust that's starting to collect on these uh, on on these reflectors. And so, because they, they put these things, they started putting these uh, reflectors on the Earth's surface in... The moon between, surface. I'm sorry, you're right. The moon, I said the Earth's surface. The moon surface between 1969 and 1973. Um, and in some instances, for some of these reflectors, only about one-tenth as efficient as expected. And they're like, why, why is this thing like getting all, all jacked up? Lunar dust, people. Lunar dust is building up on these retro reflectors. They should have put like windshield wipers on them or... Or we we need like Dyson out there, yeah. Dyson? Suck up, yeah. Oh, the vacuum cleaners. Yeah, yeah. You know. I mean, this actually, if I could just make a side note here, so this when we we deal with this on Mars too, because there's a lot of dust storms on Mars, <clears throat> more so than the Moon. Not that I, I love the Moon. Don't get me wrong. <clears throat> so when we send these uh, rovers to Mars. We basically have, there's two options to power them. Okay. Solar power. Mm -hmm. And nuclear power? What's, and yeah, and, and, and using atomic energy. And so the, the downside of it, like with atomic, it lasts for, you could have, you know, hypothetically lasting hundreds of thousands or millions of years. But the heat it generates basically fries everything. Um, we don't have a really good way to harness it. So it, it produces a lot of energy, uh -huh. but same time cooks everything. And then solar power, which on Mars is tricky enough because Mars is so far away from the sun, it gets much less solar radiation. So it, 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 it takes longer to charge. And so you get any sort of dust on it, 
and it, it, it doesn't allow full recharges. Right. Mm. So this is, this is sort of the, you're dealing, you're balancing, well, I guess when you're designing these things, you got to balance, all right, what am I going to use? Sort of the short lived, you know, atomic power, you know, which is sort of, it's, it's almost like a paradox. The energy source lasts a really long time, but it fries everything. So it actually lasts a shorter time. That's why you have some of these rovers that had a working life of, you know, two years and they're still going 10 years later. Mm -hmm. because solar panels can recharge and so on. They're not covered with dust. Yeah. Um, I mean, sure. even, even on planet earth, I have solar panels on my roof and the, the, the solar panel itself, first of all, degrades the, the chemical reaction can only take place for so long. And by so long, I mean like 25 years is the lifespan, but even on earth where we have rain and everything like that, like they get dirty. And if you, if you don't clean them, like we don't have dust storms in Eastern Pennsylvania, but even just, you know, we do have just grime and pollen and all, all kinds of other things mucking them up. So even the rain that we get here doesn't do a good enough job cleaning them. Like once every two years or so, you should actually go up there and, wash them off and they'll become more efficient huh. yeah makes sense it's interesting too sometimes they'll get covered with dust and so the the rover or whatever will go into like low power sleep mode and then you'll have another storm that'll come through and sort of blow all that dust off and they power back up <laughs> wow. i'm back i'm back baby <laughs> So, well, on the moon, they, um, it, like I said, they, they think it's uh, this lunar dust that's being kicked up by uh, meteorites impacting the surface of the moon. It's not like proven, but they think like, yeah, it's, I mean, what else would put dust on there? So they're kind of, kind of going with that. Yeah. You know, or it could just be. Or like Sasquatch. Around, Maybe that's or, where Sasquatch has been hiding this whole time. You can, <clears throat> you can see these, these laser beams if you watch like a time-lapse photo of, of different observatories, especially like the, the bigger ones. Oh, are they, is that a time-lapse photo? I'm, I'm looking at the, the, the picture you're yeah. talking about. And they, they're, they're firing them out because they, <clears throat> they use that distance to, to, and they, they can get an idea of what the atmosphere is like, how it attenuates some of that signal to adjust the lenses and adjust the light that they're seeing. Uh -huh. it's, it's really interesting um, cool. are you going to talk about the what they're doing to try and solve it what uh with the the lunar um the re reconnaissance yeah yeah wait, uh, where is that at yeah the lunar reconnaissance orbit yeah, yeah yeah so that has its own reflector on it and but that's orbiting around the uh <laughs> it's orbiting around the moon at a speed of about 3600 miles an hour and so you can Obviously, it's, it's hard enough to hit these tiny little reflectors on the surface of the moon, let alone a, you know, a speeding target going, you know, orbiting around the moon. But, um, yeah, in uh, a team, uh, let's see, outside uh, in France, uh, they reflected laser light off of the, they actually hit the orbiter and reflected back and they figured about 25 photons made the trip made the round trip uh, holy that's, cow yeah it's crazy amazing they can count like the number yeah. of photons like oh, 25 we're good we're good so um that's what they're doing they're trying to figure out they're trying to use the uh, the lunar the lunar reconnaissance orbiter as um kind of like as a backup because the the you know the reflectors on the surface of the moon are getting a little get a little dirty it happens what are you gonna do? It's fifty years old, fifty plus years old. Yeah, crazy, right? Send that's, more people I mean, back to the moon. Yeah, that's why we should go back. Take a dust, yeah. take a yeah. Swiffer. Just, just. <laughs> but uh, we should get a lunar Roomba. Just, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> just <laughs> drives around like the maid in the Jetsons, just yeah. wiping things off. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be fantastic. Ah. Uh, very cool, but you know, hey, 
we have a space force now. Let's let's get to it. <laughs> Put something on there. I, I mean, I how would you clean it up besides actually physically getting like just wiping the surface of it? Because you couldn't have. There's no. There, there's very little atmosphere on the moon. Practically nothing. No, you, you need have to have like, like compressed air. Like, psh. yeah. But how long would <laughs> you'd you have prefer- to bring your own air? To bring your own air. Yeah. You, hmm. I'm sure, there's some engineer out there. It's like you idiots. We know how to fix this. <laughs> yeah, they come Tell up us some asinine idea that would blow up. <laughs> That's how I so, feel with engineers. Very good, Jesse. Way to alienate just another. <laughs> just kidding. I started my undergraduate career as an engineer, so here I am. There you have it. All right, I'm out of news stories for the day. You guys, yeah, got anything else? I, nope. I'm out as well. I've got a few I'm going to save for next week. Yeah. Um, just because we're, yeah. No, I've but they got, sound exciting too, so. Yeah. No, they're going to be good. I've, I got Death Valley. My. Oh, yeah. You did. Yeah. You, I'm really Yeah, my a long, long time listener, first time caller, my friend Barry it texted me. He's like, he was listening. He's like, don't forget to talk about Death Valley. <laughs> I didn't next week. And uh, <laughs> I forgot to talk about Death Valley is like <laughs> translation. And I want to talk about some uh the ice stupas that they're they're building up in Nepal. What did you call me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh long time long time listener Vince passed along, but I had actually already known about it. Not to toot my own horn. Thanks but, for nothing, Vince. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the old news. <laughs> Uh, but Just kidding. Really Love cool. you, Vince. It's a really interesting idea about how to how to provide water in these communities that relied on sort of glacial ice, and the glacial ice has melted due to climate change. And so, what they're doing to solve that problem, thanks to an engineer. See, full circle. There you go. If there, there was a problem, yo, I'll solve it. Yeah. There's your teaser for next week. Yeah. All right. And then, uh, yeah, we got some uh, got some fun. Fun things coming up with the flannel cast in the next couple of weeks. We got a special thing planned for episode 60. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to say what it is. You might be able to listen to a past episode. And I think we might have accidentally talked about, but I'm going to make it a, a surprise. Or if you're a Patreon, you, you definitely know, because we definitely talk about it after the fact. So, yeah. Um, all right. So I think that's, that's all we got. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. Um, yeah. Thank you. Let's see. Check us out on go to our uh, check us out on our website geologyfinalcast.com if you like the stories that we were talking about and you want to read up on them uh, a little more in detail and see what they're all about. Uh, we post those stories to the website um, every week. Um, hit us up on uh, geology or uh, on Facebook um, facebook.com/geologyfinalcast. You can hit us up on Twitter at geoflannelcast. Um, and if you'd like to help out the podcast a little bit, help us pay the bills, uh, trying to upgrade some equipment. Uh, if you'd like to become a Patreon subscriber to the podcast, we have a couple different tiers. If you want to help us out, uh, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, for uh, some of the tiers, you can hang out with us while before we start recording, while we record, and after we record every week. And... Um, I don't know, some fun things like that. One of our yeah. Patreon marks is listening right now. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you become a, we call a Topaz tiered Patreon subscriber, you can pick your own episode topic and watch us squirm around and try to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, we've had, we've done uh, two of those already. Mark was uh, one of them that we uh, we did for the Zealandia episode. Uh, like two or three weeks ago and then uh um uh mar from uh, last week we we uh yeah, we marv had topics. like nine topics to cover yeah, yeah, yeah so thanks marv keep them coming um yeah so uh you, you can always do that if you want to help out but if uh otherwise if you still want to help out and um just, just tell a friend to tell your friends yeah, like it's, it's tell, tell a friend podcast. august tell a friend august we have uh I guess uh, this is the last week of Tell a Friend August. By the time the next one comes out, it'll be September. So I'm, I'm, yes. ex- I'm excited for September, which is like uh, Tell Your Pal September. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just, work on that one. We got a week to, we'll, we'll. Tell a moderate acquaintance <laughs> <laughs> September. Spread the word September. 
Um, See all right. you in September. No. Okay. All right. Hey, don't um, forget to check out formattingformula.com. Yes. Uh, YouTube forward slash C forward slash formula, formatting formula. Uh, tell them the geology flannel cast sent you. Thanks for listening. Um, Oh, you can also check out our, our podcast episodes. We put them up on, well, we've been putting them up for a while now on YouTube. So if you want to see what our lovely faces look like. Um, Ooh. Yeah. Can watch Steve needs on. a haircut. Steve does need a haircut. Was, yeah. Look at that. Yeah, no, it's, you're looking like Jesse circa 1999, 2000. <laughs> it's covering, covering my ears. Wow. Yeah. Something. So, I, I, um, I got a haircut in February. <laughs> It's, wow it's, it's now been, august yeah. it's been a so, hot minute yeah all right everyone thank you so much for listening uh we love you guys and we will see you guys next week bye thank you bye, bye.